Hey, Rodney, we got Tim on the line. What do you want to ask him? What are you spending your time on right now? The best thing that you can do early on is hire an assistant to take non-revenue generating activities off your plate. All the stuff that, that's just noise. You have to know what revenue generating activities are. Like what is a direct correlation to making money? Which activities? And really in our business, Rodney, it's finding deals, it's raising capital, and it's whatever your dispositions method is, whether selling your properties or refinancing and holding and refining your operations kind of a thing. So sourcing deals, sourcing money, and refining your operations. Those are revenue generating activities and that's it, right? Everything else is noise. So right. you got to get away from the noise and just focus on those things. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Horowitz Capital. Very excited for today's show. It's another one of our Ask the Expert episodes, and we have two absolutely amazing people on the line with us. We got uh, Tim Brotz and Rodney Robinson. Tim, first of all, you know, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, man. Hey, I appreciate you having me. I know we run into some of the same circles, so uh, it's good to finally connect in person or at least virtually, but yeah, uh, appreciate the value you're enough. putting out there, man. So thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I know uh, we got yeah. several mutual friends. They all think very highly of you and uh, I'm excited to to hear from you, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. well, one-on-two, two-on-one, whatever. But <laughs> sounds, uh, sounds good, man. Here we go. Uh, no, I, you know, I, I was grown through, you know, high school and college and Always wanted to, it was very money motivated. And when I was going through college, it was 03 to 07. And um, everybody's making money in real estate, right? There are oh, people yeah. that um, really had no business making money. And I was just like, if this person's making money, I'm going to get rich doing this stuff. You know? Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Trying to, try to understand what's happening with the real estate dynamics in 2006, 2007. So I'm a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, graduated from uh, Cleveland or, you know, graduated from college, moved from Cleveland out to uh, New York City, really just because my brother lived there, not because, you know, uh, I wanted to light the world on fire, but I got, I got involved in real estate with a real estate license, right? I went and got licensed. And for some reason, I parked my license with a commercial shop instead of some residential brokerage. And I brokered retail and office leases and uh, got bottom of the barrel scraps, but uh, brokered, you know, my first deal took me like seven or eight months. And it was 400 square feet on some side street, Greenwich Village. And we still signed a lease for $10,000 a month for 400 square feet on a 12-year wow. lease term with 4% annual escalations. Wow. And as a money-motivated kid at the age of 22, I start doing the math. And I'm like, this landlord is going to make almost $2 bucks over the next 12 yeah. years. For doing 400 months. square feet. Yeah. On 400 square feet. Not to mention the other seven retail spaces and 15 stories of apartments and everything else. And I was like... I'm on the wrong side of the coin. I need to be owning yeah. real estate, not brokering it. And so I, I uh, we had a crappy winter and I wanted to get out of the snow and I wanted to move down South. And somebody told me great things about Charleston, South Carolina, mm -hmm. went down to Charleston, loved it. And uh, just went through that whole analysis phase of just studying and, you know, buying the courses and all that stuff for about six, seven months. And then uh, getting ready to invest in real estate. And then the entire market collapses at the end of 2008. <laughs> and I was yep. like, what do you put? Uh, but, it, yeah. but it was fortunate because, you know, I was able to go and start buying property for pennies on the dollar and mm -hmm. um, very different market than what you see today. You know, back then you couldn't walk down the street without seeing four or five bank owned yeah. houses offered for pennies on the dollar, but there was no mm -hmm. money, at least for newbies like me at the time uh, to invest in those deals. So there's plenty of deals, but no money today. There's a lot of money and not as many deals. Right. And so um, bought my first house on my credit card, didn't know what I was doing, fixed it up, flipped it, sold it 110 days later and made, you know, 13, $14,000 on it. So now I'm hooked. That's right? sweet. I'm, so you bought, you bought a house on a credit card. I, I think that's, that's <laughs> yeah. extremely, uh, there's a little risk there, but it's very creative. I mean, you, you see yeah. the value, the market crashed, you know, I used to, I, I refer to that as like the great real estate sale of 2009, but, and I, I think you took advantage of an opportunity, you know, banks weren't lending. And I, I tried to get a couple of loans, you know, that year as well, but, uh, you know, banks just weren't lending or they, they tightened their standards. So well, yeah, they, they weren't lending boom. to people like me who didn't have a balance sheet or didn't have any money and didn't have any right. credit, right? Like, but people who had big balance sheets and people who had experience, people who had cash flowing assets, like banks make money by lending their money. So it's not like they went out of business. They just only loaned it to people with big balance sheets. And those people went on buying sprees of just, you know, picking up everything. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I think somebody thinks, oh, you bought something, you bought a house on your credit card. What are you thinking? Um, mm -hmm. Especially in the, the greatest recession of all time or in the past hundred years, at least. And um, to me, it wasn't that risky. To me, I was buying a, a house, a duplex for $15,000, 
that I could rent each side out for 500 bucks a month and make a thousand dollars a month on it. So like, to me, yeah. at least I, I, didn't, I was, I didn't know anything about real estate other than like from basic economics, I knew I could get my money back in 18 months, yeah. you know, the, the, so, the simple math works on that. I mean, yeah. 15 months you, you pay, I mean, obviously there's interest charges, but you put two renters in there and your, your credit card is getting paid for. So, yep. you know, yep. at, at that price, you know, I, I wish, I wish in 2009, you know, I knew enough to pull out my credit card and buy a $15,000 property, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's just, it was probably ignorance yeah. on, on fire. You know what I mean? It was probably one yeah. of these. I didn't know any better. Like, what's the worst thing that could happen. I just moved out of my parents' house. I just moved back in with my parents, you know, like, yeah, I just didn't care. Uh, so, um, I was already broke. I was just gonna be a little bit broker, I guess if, uh, if it didn't play out, but I made money. Yeah. And so I got into wholesaling, I got into fix and flips. I got into like buying, um, rental properties and, uh, just kind of went through that whole, whole phase, had a lot of ups, a lot of downs, went broke in 2012, started all over, moved back to Cleveland, Ohio in, in 2012, 2013, and, uh, kind of pressed the reset button then. And then, uh, that's cause I chased too many shiny objects. Um, mm -hmm. after I, I thought I knew what I was doing in, in real estate, I sold my real estate and then tried some other businesses that didn't play out. And then um, real estate was a, what saved me. I, I still own my primary home, sold that, mm -hmm. was able to pay down uh, some debts and then just moved back to Ohio and, and started from scratch again in Ohio and uh, built a portfolio of uh, about 140 doors over the course mm -hmm. of the next few years and transacted many more uh, beyond that. And uh, had some had some business partners that got married to. Like I had an exclusive relationship with these guys. They put up the money, I did all the work. And what happens is like when they put up a certain amount of money and then they don't put up any more money, their value doesn't really increase anymore. Mm -hmm. And my value continuously increased as I continued to, you know, have more business acumen and experience and connections and resources and opportunities and stuff. And it just ended up, you know, souring the relationship. Um, we mm -hmm. ended up going our separate ways. We liquidated everything. So I pressed the reset button again in 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really let me kind of spread my wings. I was able to go out and uh, start working with other private money lenders and joint venturing with other operators and partners and, uh, you know, sponsored some loans on some deals down out of state and, and stuff. And so got me in to a couple different other circles and it was, you know, the best thing that could have happened to me look, looking back on it. So got out of that relationship, uh, that business partnership. And then, uh, yeah. just now if I can hit the pause button, you, you mentioned 140 units is about what you had. Were those all single family or combination, single multifamily? What, what, what did that portfolio look like? Yeah, when I when I went back to Cleveland in 2012, I had um, these guys essentially came to me and said, "Hey, yep. man, we'll we'll give you 300 grand to go play Monopoly." Mm -hmm. And so my, that was my best option. And and they had 67 percent of the company. I had 33 percent of the company. It was two brothers. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up uh, going to work, and I just kept on rolling the money forward. We did everything from high end flips, low end flips, mm -hmm. uh, single family rentals, duplexes, triplexes, and I fell into my first eight unit apartment building around Christmas of 20. 12, I guess it was. And, right. um, and after that first year of doing a whole bunch of different kinds of stuff with those guys, I realized that the apartments had the scale that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I, we stopped doing anything single family and just focused on apartments. So bought a few more, I bought another eight unit, bought a 14 unit, a 23, 31, and just kept on trading up into bigger and bigger yeah. portfolios. And so I had, you know, I don't know, I'd say 10 buildings for a total of 140 units, probably. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. yeah and that's, so, that's a good know, way to good way to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, liquidated that before the market got hot. Unfortunately, I mean, those properties are probably worth way more like three, four times what I was, what I was into them for, but, um, still all good. I was glad to kind of just get out of that, that business partnership and just start doing my own thing. And so I got back into like the turnkey single family space. We were flipping about 80 to hundred houses a year. I built up a small team, um, uh, with an acquisitions guy, an operations guy, and essentially a dispositions guy. And uh, we just went to work and um, had some success in 2015, started a management company in 2016 that took our eye off the ball. And that was a pretty tough year. Um, and then in 2017 started, you know, got into a groove again and um, built up, you know, a few hundred units actually kind of passively and some deals that I was sponsoring loans on and raising some money for down in like Georgia area. And then had a, had, you know, some units up in Ohio too, and then still had this transactional flipping business. And by, you know, August of 2017, I sat back and I looked at my net worth and where was I spending my time and what do I want to do with my life and realized that 90% of my net worth came from my apartments and it was only like 10% of my time. And so yeah. uh, I was like, this, this epiphany uh, occurred. And I went back to my team and I said, stop doing anything single family. We're only 
looking at multifamily now. So acquisitions guy, no more single family houses, only looking at apartments. Project manager, no more renovating houses, only renovating apartments. Dispositions guy, instead of selling houses, you're only going to asset manage apartments. And that's what we ended up doing. Um, yeah. and, and it's wild, man. When you draw a line in the sand and kind of burn the ships from what you're all doing, all of a sudden it was apartment after apartment after apartment that just showed up as we yeah. focused on that. Yeah, I think, you know, burning the ships, you know, a lot of people use that phrase and I, I love it. Um, that it's basically what I did. I, I literally retired from the Marine Corps last week, right? And so three years ago, um, I decided to burn the future ships. And I told myself, I am not looking for another job ever. You know, I, I put my retirement date on the board three years ago and, you know, did the same thing. I, I think what that does for somebody and, and, you know, let me know if it's the same for you, but it commits you a hundred percent, you know, once, mm -hmm. once you're committed to that course of action, it's just like, I'm doing this. There's no, no turning back. There's no going to the left or going to the right. It's yeah. a or bust. And I think for me, that was one of the keys that led to, you know, the success that I've had so far. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and first of all, congratulations. That's amazing. Thanks. And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, like humans, guess what? We are resilient beings, right? Mm -hmm. If our backs against the wall and our, and our, options are either succeed or die yeah. humans tend to succeed like we'll figure it out right you got to almost put yourself in that constraint in order to make that happen and i think yeah. why a lot of people don't have the success that they that they could have is because they're just they have this little safety net they feel comfortable it's not mm -hmm. in it's not uncomfortable enough for them to have to get outside of that zone and have to start doing things they really don't want to do and i think one of the things that i've done unintentionally at first and now very intentionally is I create these constraints in my life and I yeah. create these constraints where like, screw it. I'll just burn the ships. Right. Like, like, all yeah. right, now I need to make this happen. Right. So I got to think more resourcefully. I need to figure out the resources, the connections, the time, um, uh, all that kind of stuff in order to make this, this other thing work, whatever I'm doing. And I still, I still try to do that. I try to put constraints up. Like I'll go and contract a property without knowing anything about it just to contract it. Cause then it forces me to go do the due diligence and underwrite and renegotiate if I have to and, and uh, learn yeah. something new. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, almost, <laughs> you know, it's kind of scary to some people, but to me, I just have to go and create that constraint in order to like get a lot of stuff done. It's like packing you know, I, for vacation. When do you pack? You pack like yeah. three hours before you leave for the airport. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, and I, I think, you know, what you mentioned, it, there's perceived risk there. I think a lot of people perceive the risk and they don't go after that. And they think, oh, my gosh, you get something in our contract with, you know, sight unseen. But, you know, if you understand the reality of, of the game, there's a lot of contingencies built into most contracts. I mean, now nowadays in a competitive market, you're not seeing as many contingencies, but you can buy something like that sight unseen and know you've got, you know, 30 days or so to conduct due diligence you know, and get in and figure things out, you know? So um, I, I think you make a good point. A lot of people look at it and say it's risky, but I think it's more of a perceived risk than it is an actual risk. Mm -hmm. You just got to know, know the game a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I agree hundred percent, man. I think I've, I've been around the block enough times where it's not really risky to me, right? Like I know exactly what to look for. And uh, when you spend 10,000, let alone, you know, I, I don't know, I've probably 30,000 hours in commercial real estate to the point where um, it's very hard for somebody to pull the wool over on my eyes. So even though like I'm looking at something and contracting something without ever seeing it, I still know what to look for and, and I can kind of judge an opportunity uh, without having to see it physically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, the better, you know, markets and areas and the whole real estate game. I mean, if you know a market very well and something comes up in the market, I mean, it doesn't take much more than looking at a price per door to say that's probably a good deal. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so there, there's some very simple math that you get from your experience where you just look at something and say, boom, that's it. That's going to be a good deal. Let's mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. But cool. Cool. So let's, uh, let's talk about, you know, one of these, uh, um, apartment complexes that you've done, you know, maybe one of the more recent ones. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the type of stuff that you're doing now and, and what it looks like? Yeah. I'm, so, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, I, think, I think chapter one of my life was that first mm -hmm. seven or eight years of messing up and doing bad deals and being in bad business yeah. partnerships and having tenants burn me and contractors burn me and um, all that kind of stuff. And that was like chapter one, I think, of my life. Chapter two probably started when I started getting a little bit better at real mm -hmm. estate uh, about four years ago. 
and built up this portfolio. So today I have a portfolio of north of 4,000 doors, over $400 million. And we've transacted thousands of units above that as well, which is kind of what I'm currently holding. And, um, uh, and I think chapter two is just like growth mode, build your balance sheet is, is what yeah. I, would, I would kind of like that too. So I, I was taking out any property, especially a couple of years ago, early on, I'd buy a you know, 24 unit, I'd buy a 36 unit, I'd buy a 14 unit. And I would just grow the portfolio. So that way I could, I could then sponsor and be a GP on all these other bigger apartment complexes and stuff. And so that's what was like really my goal. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, I was able to start sponsoring $10 million, $20 million deals. And we just kept on growing, growing, growing uh, that way. Today, uh, this year has been a lot of refinement for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how I'm closing down chapter two, which is um, selling off all the small buildings, selling off all the C-class, heavy management intensive type stuff, you know, selling off my storage facilities, selling off, selling off my office buildings, 90% of my portfolio is apartments. And that's, I want it to be almost hundred percent of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And really the only two asset classes that we're focused on right now are uh, workforce housing apartments in like B kind of areas, B class, A class areas, but workforce, I don't do anything luxury. I don't yeah. do anything C class or D class. And then, um, and buildings over hundred units in mostly the Sun yeah. Belt, And that's my, that's my buy box. And then I buy these like kind of unique assets that are, that are just a little bit different, like a uh, historical building that I'll turn into like micro offices. I have mm -hmm. um, this ridiculous mountain house in Western North Carolina. That's 12,000 square feet on 50 acres. Um, that's just all timber frame, just absolutely stunning. And uh, we have like a, it's like a high-end Airbnb on that. Um, and I, I use it for personal use too, right? And then I just bought an island in South Carolina, uh, right, next to, right next yes. to Hilton Head. And uh, yep. we're doing some cool stuff with that. We're going to put like a kind of a glamping tent campsites uh -huh. and uh, upscale kind of camping on this private island, 110 acres of yeah. lands plus 357 acres of, of marshlands that I bought around it. And um, it's going to be a cool kind of like event venue, masterminds, corporate retreats, weddings, and um, just kind of like unique pieces of property like that, that you cannot duplicate anywhere else. Uh, yeah. So we do one or two of those a year. And then the other thing is, uh, it's just otherwise, it's just boring ass blue collar apartment buildings, right? <laughs> like, you know, middle of the road, insulated. Uh, they're not sexy, but man, they, they you know, print money and, and they're great long term almost like bonds of just predictable yeah. cash flow and, and appreciation. They're like ATM machines, you know, it's not sexy. You look at it and it's like, you know, everybody's seen an ATM machine before and it's not exciting, but you know, the cash flow is there, you know, they, they yeah. just keep on spitting out money and yeah. uh, it, it's nice. I think you got, you got kind of a nice mix of sexy and then just the, the boring cash flow stuff, you know? But, yeah. Well, uh, one of my early, not, not mentor, well, I guess technically anybody you take advice from is I guess a mentor, but there's a guy I knew who, um, he actually sold his company. Uh, he had like a, a commercial a supply company, sold it to Home Depot and turned into Home Depot commercial division. So like he's, he made a lot of money and, and this guy was in a mastermind that I was in and I was talking with him one time and he's like, uh, and he was like getting into the private equity and his buddy had a $2 billion real estate trust or something like that. He's like, listen, you need a couple of properties in your portfolio for the front of the brochure. They're not the money makers but they look beautiful, gets people to open the brochure, right? They judge the book yep. by the cover. And then the returns are made through these boring B class, yep. middle of the road, um, just, just uh, um, cookie cutter kind of deals that you just do over and over and over again. Yep. So he's like, you need both of those. So I don't know. That always yeah, you know, kind of sat with me. We, we, we got some mansard roof properties. I think we got five properties that have mansard roofs all in South Carolina, all 70s built. You know, those are not the front of the brochure property. So those, <laughs> yeah, those right. are the other ones you're talking about that are paying all the bills. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's they're they're not sexy and and they're they're producing. We're we're chasing. You know, we'll, we'll have a couple of you know for the brochures. We're we're, we're chasing those right now. But uh, and, um, and here's the thing, guys. You don't you don't need those, right? I think it just makes it easier to to, oh, to attract the masses. That's why Grant Cardone's mm -hmm. doing a great job right now. Or he's had a lot of success because he's got all these sexy properties, right? And, yeah. and he's gotten so much exposure there that people, they'd rather have a sexy property and be able to say that they're in that deal versus have the highest return. I've just always attracted the people who, who their sexy was, what's the return on my investment, right? Like what's the return on my oh, yeah. equity? And uh, that's always been their sexy is those, those automatic dividend payments, mailbox money hitting their, uh, their account every single month that's sexy to a lot of the people that I've worked with, but I'm seeing there's an entire another dynamic 
that want to be able to say, I own 1% of, a, of an island, of a private island. I own 1% right. of this castle up on a hill, you know? Like, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's unique. It's a little bit different, new for me even. And, um, uh, you know, I think, I think, especially with where the market is right now, it's, it's a very, um, you know, a, a, you know, perceived tough market to be in if you're not creative and if you're not listening to what people want, like, what are they looking for? What are they willing to invest in? And, you know, we've just been able to kind of take the temperature of some of our investors and some of them are looking for more, uh, the sexy stuff. Some of them are yep. looking of just, you know, ego and image driven. Some of them are looking for more equity growth. Some of them are looking for more coupon cutting of, uh, of, of, uh, dividend distributions. And so, yeah. uh, just kind of figuring out and then, and then order taking, and then going and finding an asset that, that meets that bill. Matches. Nice. Nice. Appreciate it. So uh, I'm going to switch here a little bit. Uh, you, you kind of brushed around your, your motivation, but if you could, um, you talk about your big burning why for a little bit, what is your why? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, I think early on people are like, I want money. Right. And I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, society has, uh, shamed people for wanting that, but uh, it's not, it's not the money that you want, right? It's, it's, what does the money do? That's noble. Yeah. And, uh, for me, I used to want the, the fancy stuff, dude, I'm, I'm not a fancy guy, right? I drive a Jeep Wrangler. I'm just more of a Wrangler mm -hmm. kind of guy. And, uh, I could buy a Lamborghini dealership, but I just don't want that. It's just not my vibe. I'm a crappy right. driver and I hit a bunch of potholes and be pissed because I've bent a rim anyway. So <laughs> I'm yeah. just more the Wrangler guy. I'm more the beach, you know, paddleboard, like that's more lifestyle driven. And that's, that's really became the driver for me after it was money that it was more like lifestyle driven. And, um, and now it's more impact, I guess it's as, as almost cheesy, corny or whatever, as that might sound, it's more about making an impact on my kids, on other people's families. And it's why I have my kids book series, little legacy library. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, th I think a lot of people, uh, they want the fancy stuff and they want the vacations and they want, uh, you know, and there's a lot of noble purposes, retiring your spouse, mm -hmm. retiring your parents yeah. and taking uh, your, your family on a vacation that people only read about magazines. I think that's amazing. And, uh, but you know, there's, there's a lot of things that they don't tell you about either. Right. Like one of my best friends, um, daughter was just uh, like, she's like my niece, like I'm, I'm tighter with her than I am my, my actual nieces. And, um, she just got diagnosed with brain cancer. Right. And, Ooh. um, just absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible. And that's something that they don't prepare you for. And they don't tell you like what to, what to go build wealth for, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm in a position where I can say, Hey man, what do you need? Right? Like, like, yeah. let me, let me help any way that you, if your work will not support you, guess what? You're coming on my payroll. I'm going to take care of you, whatever that, that yeah. looks like. And, um, and that's the kind of stuff that they don't, uh, not a lot of people talk about um, of why to pursue wealth, personal finance and, and building portfolios, like not what, not the money, but what the money can do. Right. And the, yeah. and the impact it can make the, the churches and hospitals and libraries that it can build, um, you know, the people you can retire, the impact, the, the, you know, just, just you, the positivity that you can, the, yeah. that you can create in the, in society. So that's, you that's more, really the more driver options, for me now. bigger options. So yeah, I appreciate yeah, that. The options um, that you get, man, it's, it's yeah. a big deal, but th there's also kind of like an internal flame drive desire of just like achievement. Also, it's more of like mm -hmm. a way of keeping score almost of like, how big can I push this in order to inspire mm -hmm. other people that they don't have to go and stay at their dead end job for their entire life. Like, dude, there's more out there. And, and if you believe in yourself, let me show you what, what this can possibly look like. And there's, there's a little yeah. bit of that, that, that really drives me too. Awesome. Awesome. All right. And last question before we bring Rodney on what's next for you. Oh man. Um, yeah. I used to set goals out like 10, 15 years of what I wanted to accomplish. And then you realize like this stuff starts compounding like substantially mm -hmm. where I can't even like, there's new opportunities and there's, there's new things, right? Like I got two little kids, a six-year-old and a four-year-old and I realized once I had kids and then once they started going to school, there's different things that I actually care about and things that I want out of my life. Not instead of just growing a massive portfolio, if that ever uh, would take me away from the family, I wouldn't want to do that. So now I'm asking myself questions like, all right, over the next 24 months, I want to hit a billion dollars in assets in my portfolio. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I want a billion dollar portfolio of real estate and these unique uh, assets and these the apartment buildings. And that's kind of like, how do I do that? working 20 to 24 hours a week. I'm willing to work six hours a day, Monday through Thursday, and that's it. 
So it kind of creates those constraints that I was talking about before. Yeah. How can I do that? What are the most important activities that I can be spending my time on? What is the highest return on my time and my team's time? How do I set my team up to be able to handle and manage more of these things without taking on too much more overhead? And um, I, those are the kind of the questions that I'm asking myself right now. Yeah. So that, that way I can design my life and then I, my business kind of fills in in those six hours a day, four days a week that the kids are at school. And then I can, I can be a hundred percent present with them. So uh, yeah, man, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I love it. I love it. I mean, I think society's kind of gotten away from that, you know, where you're so busy with your job, your career and, and trying to you know make money that you forget to live your life. And um, I, I think, I think everybody should just take a step back and design their life and fit their work in. But uh, mm -hmm. Um, but that's, that's what I'm trying to do too. I'm, I'm still, I'm still on the 40 hour work week, trying to get down to the four hour work week. So yep. anyway, we'll see. Well, well, and cool. and well, I think it's, it's one of those things where like, uh, I, I also need to be hundred percent focused while I'm doing the work. Right. So like my kids also know that they don't bother daddy when I'm at work six hours a day, Monday through Thursday, but they're not really here anymore. But, uh, mm -hmm. my wife knows I'm in the zone. Like it, you, you'd be surprised at how much more focused you are though. Like during those work hours, if you have those constraints on, you're not checking social media all the time. You're not, you know, uh, tooling around on YouTube and watching whatever. And, and, um, you're actually doing the activities that matter in order to get the results and you're able to accomplish in 20 to 24 hours, the same thing that you were doing in 40 to 50 hours a week. So it's, um, Absolutely. it's again, it goes kind of go back to that whole burn the ships kind of a mentality in a, um, in a smaller way, but yeah, man, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, let's bring Rodney on the show and, uh, Hey Rodney, why don't you take a couple minutes, introduce yourself, tell us about you and, uh, we'll go from there. Hey guys. Thank you, Brian, for having me on, Tim. I'm really enjoying this uh, dialogue. Um, it feels like I'm in a networking session, but I forget people are going to be listening to this. Um, so yeah, I, I actually am a working professional. That's how I communicate with others that are, have some sort of interest in, in real estate. Um, I've been in my career for about 10 years. I'm a supply chain manager, um, and I've always been interested in real estate. I feel like it's my thing. I've always had a heart for it. I started studying in 2013, just understanding real estate investing. Um, and my wife and I got married and we just went down a path of what's our next step. So our first step was we bought a house in 2016 mm -hmm. and um, that ended up being our second rental. And in 2019, we bought our first rental, fixed it up. Um, 2020, that was actually when I met you, Brian, you may not have met me, but I yeah. met you. I was at, um, it was a big deal for me because it was my first um, conference for multifamily. I went to Michael Blank's Dealmaker Live. It was virtual. And that was one of the benefits of 2020. In spite of the many challenges, I was able to do something like that, um, that I otherwise would not have been able to do. And so I, I got to learn from a lot of great people what syndication is about, multifamily is about. We have four young children. That first house we did, all it took was one time for me to say, I don't want to do that again. I mean, it's, it's cash flowing. It's great, but I, I'm not going to do it 20 times, 40 times, yeah. 80 times like you, Tim. Um, <laughs> so yeah, proof of concept. I, 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 I did two before I realized right. I needed to step two? it up. So yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I said, I'll either work harder or not do this at all. So I said, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'd like to get the same results, but, or the same effort and, and more output. So that was my desire for multifamily. So this year I was able to passively invest in a real estate fund with someone that I know well. And I feel like I'm moving along. So I got an opportunity to be on the show and listen to, to you, Brian, and, and you, Tim, talk about your experience. And I'm pretty fired up. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you, you touched on it a little bit, but uh, I also want to dive into your big burning why as well. So tell us, tell us what's your why. Yeah. So my why, I think it'll, you know, just like you, Tim, when I started, it was, I, I, it was always, let's grow well. That was a big thing for me, especially when you get your first job, you realize you have an opportunity to save so much, especially when your expenses were as low as mine. You know, just my wife and I starting off, no children. Um, then we got to a place where all of our needs were met financially. And, you know, I'm thankful. I still want more. I want multifamily. I want to be able to put large apartment deals together and create wealth for others. I think there are two sides of it. I want others to know the options that they have available to them. And my specific area of focus in, in terms of a, a target group, that's working professionals. So I want other working professionals to understand that outside your 401k, outside of stocks, there are other options for passive investors. 
um, they choose those routes because it's most convenient. And, and the second part is I want to make a difference for residents. Um, aside from that, you know, with the wealth, I, you know, of course, you want to grow your personal wealth and you want to feel that sense of achievement. But we have a, a vision as well to help others that need help, just like you said, Tim. You know, you just never know where it's going to come from. But there are a lot of, a lot of people that are hurting in this mm -hmm. world and we have opportunities. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate that. Well, here, here comes my favorite part of the, uh, the podcast episode is where I say, hey, Rodney, we got Tim on the line. What do you want to ask him? <laughs> All right. So, yeah, Tim, you, uh, you had such a breadth of experience. And it, it sounds like you were a little critical of yourself from, you know, some of the, the, the different what you call distractions over, the, over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that you got more focused over the later years or when did you, when did the light bulb go off and, you know, what, are, what would you say you're focusing on today? What did that journey look like for you? Yeah. Great question, man. I, I think, you know, you see all these entrepreneurs on social media and stuff and, and they're calling themselves so like, like serial entrepreneurs. I thought that was so cool. Oh my gosh, they own all these businesses. They must be such good business people. And that was like a sexy thing. And so I thought like, maybe I should go and dip my toes in this business and that business and all these different things. And when you're that spread out, you're not focused on anything. And now when I hear somebody talking yeah. about them being a serial entrepreneur, I think I feel bad for this person, right? I bet they're completely yeah. broke. I bet they're completely lost. They have zero direction. Like I, I almost want to help them if they're a serial entrepreneur. Now right. I'm, I'm, I'm into like this group of, uh, I've kind of gotten through this phase. Like there's a few different phases in business. And I think when you're doing like up to a million dollars, that's the proof of concept phase, dude. You got to put your, put your head down, just stay focused, right? And then a million to about $10 million in, re in revenue is, uh, is kind of like the, it's almost like hell zone, man, because it's really tough because you're making enough money. You know, it works, you know, you got something, but you're not making enough where you can bring on all these like multiple six figure talents into your organization and start building out a real network and a real team. So that was like uh, tough, but like, once you get past that, then I know a lot of people who have like multiple eight figure businesses and are making millions and millions of dollars a year. And they are serial entrepreneurs because their business is, you know, deploying money into other people's businesses kind of a thing. And they're right, investing right. passively and that's how they're serial entrepreneurs. So uh, early on, I thought it was just cool to go and try to operate. And you, it's very, very difficult to operate. Even if like, I have a couple of different businesses, but I have people who run each one of my different businesses. I have a, a who who handles the operations for every single thing that I, that I'm doing uh, each business that I'm, that I'm, um, running. And I really only have three businesses. Right. I have, I have my education business, my coaching, consulting, that kind of stuff. I have my real estate operations business. And then I have my kids books, which is, um, really just, you know, another, it's almost like an offshoot, but I have my wife and, and one That's of my cool. best friends who are running that. So like, I, you know, what of my, I, I guess when, when I went through that stuff and I got unfocused, I realized how important focus was. I mean, you know, I, I think we read about it. We hear about it. Yeah. A lot of these things, but some things you just got to experience, right? Like going broke, I needed to experience that. Um, and, and not being focused, I needed to experience that because it makes me that much better of a steward of capital today and that much better of a, of a, of a focused entrepreneur today. And it, listen, man, I have a big social media following or, you know, I, relatively, right? Um, so I have people hitting me up all the time, crypto this and Amazon e-commerce stores there and, and oh, yeah. uh, these, these new things all over the place. And I'm like, if, so here's what I do. Here's my secret. If I don't see myself dedicating, dedicated to it and doing it for at least the next three years, I won't do it. And it goes back to kind of the, the 10,000 hour um, thing of, of in order to become an expert at anything, you need to spend at least 10,000 hours doing it. That's, two, that's essentially five years on a 40 hour a week effort. Um, as entrepreneurs, maybe we can get there because, you know, we're thinking about it. We're, we're more productive and more resourceful and, and, uh, more, or, or just thinking about business all the time. Maybe we can get there in three years. Uh, but if I can't dedicate at least three years, I'm not willing to dedicate at least three years to doing whatever that one activity is, I'm not doing that business whatsoever. So that's kind of, and right. that's, it's pretty easy yeah. for me, right? E-commerce yeah. stores. I don't see yeah. myself doing e-com for the next three years. Done. Out of the way, right? Um, yeah. New opportunities or, of developing a hotel or something. I'm just not interested in doing that. I'm not going to do it, especially for the next three years. And so it just, it's easier for me to clean the slate and say no to things if I know that I'm not going to be doing yeah. it for the next three years. And that's what keeps me focused. Yeah. Oh, that's, Love that's it. a great answer. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that too. I think that's where I am in my journey. I heard someone say, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. 
-hmm. So it has actually been just about a year, over a year since I dedicated my focus on multifamily. And I'm proud of that because I was just like what you were saying. It's like, you know, crypto stocks, um, businesses, and, you know, to be able to stick to something, I'm already seeing the traction. So um, that's great. It makes I mean, a what big would difference, you say? man. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, and, and here's the thing. Yeah. And when, like, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the early on entrepreneur. Like, I like to get things going. I like the excitement of the growth mode. Like, that's, that's more my vibe. And so as soon as things get normal and they get corporate and they have SOPs in place and KPIs and metrics yeah. and measurements and all, like, dude, I, that, that, like, gives me anxiety. I want to get the <laughs> hell out of there. So um, that's not my vibe. And so, like, my business is boring now, though. And it's, it's systematized and it has SOPs and it has KPIs, but it's not me running it. But I realized that right. this is when you start printing money, right? When it gets boring is when right. you start printing cash. Yeah. And so I have somebody who runs that entire thing. And then I go do and chase these shiny objects, like not shiny objects, but like I do these, these yeah. unique things that still like an island. kind of like the island, like the, yeah. like the, uh, you know, uh, the mountain house and like some of those things that keep me excited, but still fall into the same. It's only like one branch removed from, you know, the, the, the core yeah. business. Love it still in your core focus, but it's, yeah. it's an extension based on what you've already built. And, and that, that's awesome. Um, so what, what would you say, it took you some time to get where you are and you have children now and you are now down to, I think you said six hours uh, a day on your work. Yeah. So what are you, what are you spending your, uh, your time on right now? That's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, when I, when I was a solo entrepreneur doing everything, um, the best thing that you can do early on is hire an assistant to take non-revenue generating activities off your plate. You know, all the stuff that that's just noise, right? Like the things that just, and, and, and you have to know what revenue generating activities are. Like what is a direct um, correlation to making money, which activities. And really in our business, Rodney, it's, it's finding deals, it's raising capital, and it's whatever your dispositions method is, whether selling your properties, or, um, or refinancing and holding and refining your operations kind of a thing. So sourcing deals, uh, sourcing money and refining your operations. Those are revenue generating activities and that's it, right? Everything else is noise. So right. you've got to get away from the noise and just focus on those things. That's, that's what gave me a lot of momentum to start building and growing the business because I just got obsessed with finding deals and raising money. And then my team was obsessed with the operation side of things. Um, today, and this is kind of weird. And I actually heard Dan Gilbert, you know, the owner of like Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans. Dan Gilbert yeah. said this in an interview and uh, somebody asked him a similar question. Like, what do you spend your time on? And um, uh, it's, it's almost the non-quantifiable things now that have the best return on my investment. It's mm -hmm. social media. It is being on podcast. It is the coaching, the mentoring, the, mm -hmm. the things that I don't know what can possibly come from me being on this yeah. podcast. Yeah. But who knows, yeah. dude, Roddy, maybe you bring me a 300 unit apartment building deal in Melbourne, Florida, which I have roots yeah. to, right? Like my wife's grandpa was from Melbourne actually. And so maybe oh, cool. I, I come in and I fund this entire deal and all of a sudden it grows your net worth by $5 million and my net worth by $5 million because we took down this apartment building deal together. Like, I don't know. That sounds really good. You know, or maybe it's, yeah, right, right. Or maybe it's some listener ends up sending me a message and saying, Hey, can I invest with you? Or, Hey, I want to get coached by you, Tim, or like, I don't know what can quantify, but I know that I don't do any one-on-one -on -one activities anymore. I only do one to many. That's it. Multiplier activities. So I only do one to many. Um, I don't do any, I have people asking me, you know, Hey, I'll pay you $20,000 to come and hang out for a day. I'm not interested. Right. It's because it's not a one to many activity. And I like doing things that are evergreen, like being on podcasts yeah. or uh, posting on social media. That the content's always going to be out there. And I have I've had people who saw me on Michael Blanc's podcast two years ago hit me up and be like, "Hey, man, I love your vibe. You know, can I come out to your project or can I joint venture or can I send you a deal or whatever?" And so, like, that's why that's why I like doing this kind of stuff, the marketing stuff. If I can yeah. feed the marketing funnel, it makes the deal flow easier for my acquisitions guy. It makes the money flow easier for my money, my capital manager. It makes the, the operations side easier for my COO. So I, I see myself as kind of the, the fuel that feeds those engines now. I love it. Okay. Love it. One, one point, we just hired an assistant ourselves and oh my goodness, it just, it, it's a game changer, <laughs> game changer there. 
<laughs> yeah, absolute game changer. But uh, mm-hmm. um, yeah, a lot of a lot of gold nuggets there. I'm 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 going to go back and listen to this myself. But uh, there, some something I learned a long time ago, and this was you know back in college, a you know real world example. And I'm a math nerd, right? Got two degrees in math, but uh, and I, this is true in in a lot of different things. It's a lot of times it's that one connection that takes you a long way that really moves things, you know, and and you can look at, you know, people in in the world who who move the world, you know, like, like your Elon Musk's of the world, you know, it's not, it's not the people that are moving, you know, inches and yards. It's that one person that moves things, you know, miles down the road and you never know when you're going to meet that person. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I I like your one to meaning philosophy um, and, you know, I, I still spend a lot of one-on-one time, but, you know, I'm doing dozens and dozens of calls every week because, you know, every once in a while, I find that one gem, that one person that's just going to move things way down the road for me. But, mm-hmm. uh, um, anyway, we're, we're about out of time. So I got one question for each of you to close things up. Uh, Tim, how can listeners learn more about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm real active on social media. So hit me up on Facebook, Instagram. I answer all my own messages. So if you guys have any questions, connections, resources, need to point in the right direction kind of a thing, feel free to send me a message. I'm happy to uh, connect with you. And um, uh, I'm always trying to put out you know quality content and, and help people, not just with business, but with their lives kind of thing. So um, right. yeah, I appreciate you having me, buddy. Thank you so much. This is awesome, Absolutely. Ronnie. Great to meet you too, bud. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put, uh, you. we'll put you. your Instagram handles and, and links in the show notes for anybody who wants to reach out and, and, and touch him. So Rodney, same question for you. How can people learn more about you? So yeah, I'm very active on social media. My home base is my website. It's rodneyrobinsonsecond.com. I have about a hundred blog articles on multifamily real estate, passively investing, mm-hmm. um, and a free giveaway for, uh, people that are interested in becoming ba- passive investors called the passive investor startup guide. All right. Awesome. Love it. I'm, I'm just making a note to check out your blog articles. You see a hundred blog articles on, on real estate. I bet you I can find yeah, a lot of little yeah, gems right. in there. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a lot of writing. All right. Well, we'll put, uh, put links to that in the show notes so people can check it out. And I highly encourage anybody listening to this to, to check, check out uh, if you're interested in what Tim says, or what Rodney says, you know, link up with them. Um, that said, you know, out of time, thanks so much to both of you for coming on the show today. I really, really appreciate it.